Okay, another blast from the 60s. Any of those music fans out there from the 60s? This is Mark Lindsay of Paul Revere and the Raiders. And he was one of the best well-spoken interviews, a lot like Peter Noon of Herman's Hermits, just had great stories of what was happening at the time, all their hits, how they recorded them, what was happening, uh, other people they had met along the way. A uh, really, really cool interview. So I caught up with Mark Lindsay in Anaheim, California, and this was in January of 1996, so quite a while ago. Mark Lindsay of Paul Revere and the Raiders. Hi, this is Mark Lindsay. You might remember the face from uh, Where the Action Is, or maybe the voice from uh, all your Paul Revere and the Raider records. Things like Good Things, Kicks, Hungry. Oh, in Arizona? That's kind of home base, isn't it? Anyway, thanks for flying with me today on America West Airlines. Let's go. Uh, that's a good question. We were back in Boise, Idaho, and uh, Paul Revere had a drive-in restaurant. He sold hamburgers. I worked in a bakery. I made buns. We got together that way and uh, found out we liked to make music. Actually, he started the band to raise money for his drive-in, but uh, I came along and sang, and uh, we dreamed of going somewhere, and lo and behold, we got there. Where did the costumes come from? Where was the idea for that? Oh, boy. Well, Paul Revere's name was, uh, his real name was Paul Revere something, and he changed his name, but... When we signed our first record contract, we were the downbeats. And the guy that looked at the record, the, Paul's name said, Paul Revere, why? You ought to use, that's a great gimmick. And Paul said, no, he'd been teased all his life, right? And where's your, Paul Revere, where's your horse? But finally the guy said, look, you know, downbeats is okay, but it doesn't have a ring to it. I want to merchandise you guys. You're going to be Paul Revere and the Night Riders. We thought, well, let's make it Raiders. This at least doesn't sound so much like a country swing band. So uh, the Raiders we became. Great. And then... Uh uh, where did you actually start when you started with the costumes and the trademark look? We are, at that point in time, are, we, we were wearing like La Jolla blazers and more like this, I suppose, and not quite so kooky. And one day we were walking down the street in Portland, Oregon, and we passed this costume shop, and here's all these period costumes, George Washington and Henry VIII and things. And, and I said to Paul, you know, now that's the way Paul Revere used to dress, you know. Wouldn't it be funny if? And so we rented the costumes for that evening's performance. And when we got through, we got off, at the first, first half of the show, we just wore, wore regular costumes. Second half, we put on these outfits, and all of a sudden, it was like playing with, the, with a circus. You look over, and the bass player's got a lace dickie and wearing a, a funny hat. And uh, we had such a great time. It was all like being in disguise. You could do anything, and, and it just changed the whole band's persona. We had a lot of fun. We came off stage, and the kids went crazy. We thought, maybe we better keep this in the act. It was good. What, what was the first song that actually put you guys on the charts or made it like, wow, we're a successful band? Well, the first song that got us noticed by CBS Records was Louie Louie. At that time, Louie Louie was a big hit in the Northwest. The Whalers had cut it and had a regional hit. And every band that played there had to play Louie Louie three or four times a night. It was like the anthem of the country. So we recorded it and actually were the first group signed to CBS Records, first rock and roll group in history signed to CBS on the strength of Louie Louie. And wherever we'd played in the Northwest, the song was a big hit. However, uh, the Kingsman, who also came from Portland, cut it at the same time, within a week, that we did in the same studio. And their record company promoted more in the East Coast, and it took off. And the rest, as they say, is history. But uh, it was Louie Louie that got us started. Wow. What was the first big, uh, let's say, the first most known Raider song would have been at that time? The first, the first big hit on CBS was uh, Be Stepping Out. And then good thing, or then just like me, and then uh, kicks, and then we had a string of about twenty top twenty records. We were very lucky. Uh, why do you think this is more of a generic one? But why do you think uh, '60s music is still so popular, even with people my age, and, and it's kind of held its mystique? Well, it, it's hmm, that's a good question. But I think what it is is that the music of those days it was simple lyrics, but it told a little story. There were melodies that were easy to follow. If you listen to some of the, you know, the, all the Beatles stuff, it was melody and lyrics, and it was something you could relate to. And I think that music, that if you're a teenager and you hear music uh, that works for a teenager, we have a lot of second generation fans that are being exposed to the Who and the Beatles and the Raiders and other groups from that, from that uh, genre. And if it works as a, for a teenager then, it still does today in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of 60s and the 90s music if you listen to some of the alternative bands. What, uh, at that time, there was a heavy British invasion when you guys were getting very popular. It was just like, everything was British. How did you guys deal with that? Or how it, was, it was a press agent's dream. The first thing, Derek Taylor, who had worked for the Beatles, came over, and he was our press agent. We were the first American group that he he's, that signed on with him. 
He said, this is perfect. You guys were, you repelled the British in his English accent. You repelled the British back in, back in Paul Revere's time. You can do it again, boys. And so we were billed as America's answer to the British invasion. So, you know, with the costumes, it was, it was a made in heaven press, press release thing. Well, that's great. Uh, what are some of the interesting pairings? You always hear of uh, uh, some bands that, you know, they, they once uh, someone opened up for them, like the Beatles opened up for them. Oh, yeah. Odd. What are some of the odd pairings back in the 60s? Probably, and 70s? probably the thing that amazed, uh, uh, the act that opened up for us was when uh, Mick Jagger and the Stones opened for, up for us in uh, in Pittsburgh, and he couldn't understand it. But at that time, where the action is was a huge television show. It was kind of a precursor to MTV. You know, the country got to see us and liked us, and we were on five days a week, so we were huge. And and this, you know, Jagger's backstage. Who the hell are these guys? You know, but uh, it was uh, um, it was fun. Oh, I bet. Do that one again. Oh, sorry. 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 Oh, okay. Okay, one more time. Yeah, why don't you tell me one more interesting pairing? I remember back in Pittsburgh in '67, uh, our opening act was the Rolling Stones, and at the time, where the action is was on five days a week, a precursor to MTV. It was a huge show, and we were very popular, especially back in Philadelphia was the Raiders' town. So the promoter said, "I don't care who you guys are, you have to open for the Raiders." And Mick was backstage saying, "Who the hell are these guys?" But it was interesting. Well, that's great. Uh, what was your relationship with Dick Clark, and how did he fall into making this TV show happen for you? Uh, he had done a... Um, Why don't you, can you tell me who it is, because we won't hear okay. him say that. Dick Clark was doing a pilot for, uh, actually, CBS. It was called Where the Action Is. And on the pilot was the Supremes and us and uh, Four Seasons, a bunch of groups. Pilot wasn't... CBS didn't buy it, but ABC liked it. And instead of doing a special, uh, Dick... Clark convinced them to do a five-day-a-week series, and at first it was very experimental, but, you know, you put a bunch of uh, dancers in bikinis on the beach and a bunch of crazy rock and rollers together, plus any group that was on the top ten that came through Southern California, Dick Clark would have them on his show and bandstand and then where the action is. And, uh, you know, if you're back in Iowa and you, you, know, you ain't got an ocean and babes in, uh, in, on the beach, it was fun, fun show to tune into and, and watch. Was that uh, where the action is? Was that the point where the Raiders really went stellar as far as their national or worldwide act? Where the action is was was the the probably the greatest one thing that exposed the Raiders again. Like it, as I say, it was uh, a group today can't hardly make it without television, without video exposure, and we were lucky enough to be on five days a week, and all the teenagers across America tuned in, and and we became you know kind of America's house band, I guess. Oh, great. What do you think happened to uh, pop music as it transitioned into the 70s? You became a solo artist, and, and that kind of that 60s innocence thing was over, but something happened. I, I think, unfortunately, what happened is, is the, the music business became the emphasis on business and not music, and attorneys were running things, uh, running A&R departments instead of people that had music backgrounds, and it became more important to look at the product as an entity and not the music wasn't wasn't the first focus and that is unfortunately why you had a lot of great productions huge productions that didn't really last and groups that didn't last because uh, everything was becoming so disposable then okay that makes sense uh, I'm gonna ask you about a, a bunch of songs I know in, in the demo okay. Martin did with you we've got little clips of you doing different songs because I'd like to do a little bit of a montage okay and maybe just a, you can either say uh, you know, that song was about, or so-and-so wrote that, or, okay. or, you know, something like that. A little anecdote, if you could. Uh, let's start with one of your solo songs, Arizona. Arizona. Jerry Fuller was my producer. He was producing Gary, uh, two on this. Jerry Fuller, who was producing Gary Puckett and Union Gap, uh, was given to me or suggested that he be my producer because he was having success with big uh, solo vocalists. And we were up in his uh, office playing a whole stack of, uh, of I'm going to shorten this. That's good, though. I like this one. Okay. Uh, Jerry Fuller was a producer at CBS, and he was producing Gary Puckett and the Union Gap, and they thought that he would be a good guy to do a solo vocalist like myself. So we're up in his office, and we played a stack of about 40 different demos of songs. And we went through the first 25 or so. We got to Arizona. He put it on. We got to the chorus, Arizona. And we both said, that's it. And we didn't even listen to the rest of the song before we decided to do it. 
So I'm, I'm glad that the, the second chorus, uh, second verse and chorus were good, because otherwise we'd have been in big trouble. <laughs> And that was a real big record, wasn't it? It was my first uh, gold record, then it finally went platinum. So, yeah, as, as a single artist, that was my first, thank you, big success. And then uh, what was a follow-up, Silver Bird? Silver Bird, and they're actually written by the same guy that wrote Arizona, a guy named Kenny Young. Uh, and as far as I know, he wrote about, a, he submitted a, probably 100 songs after that, and we listened to a lot of his material. These two songs were the, the standouts, we'll say. But Kenny, Kenny had a good ride on those tunes. Oh, great. Let me, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit before I do a couple more songs. Is, uh, tell me how the transition went from the Raiders' success and then you became a solo career. Well, actually, uh, people think that I left the Raiders to pursue a solo career, but actually I was still recording with the Raiders, uh, and it was CBS's idea because the Raiders were basically a hard rock group, and uh, on some of our concerts we'd do ballads and we'd get a good response from the audience, so they suggested that I spin off as a solo artist and do a softer, more middle of the road kind of thing. Maybe they're trying to make me the next Andy Williams, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, so I was doing that at the same time I was with the Raiders. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, about a year or so after Arizona, we had Indian Reservation, which was the, uh, the Raiders' biggest hit. I'll do a couple more song things real okay. fast. Uh, uh, Just Like Me was obviously recorded over again and was a big hit. Uh, what, what, tell me a little something about that song. Uh, Just Like Me probably is more famous for its guitar solo than anything else, and it was a mistake. Uh, Drake Levin, the guitar player, had done the solo, and then he said, I think I can do one better, Terry. Terry Melcher was our producer. So he did, and the engineer was supposed to erase that track, but accidentally didn't. So when he played it back, they both came back together, and everybody looked at each other and said, you know, that's kind of unique. Let's use that. So it was two solos, one on top of the other, and everybody said, how do you do that? That's great. Uh, how about Kicks? Kicks was sent to us by Barry Mann and Cynthia Weil. It was a song that they had written about a couple of songwriting, a songwriting team friends of theirs, uh, the male half of whom was getting too involved in... Uh, uh, the darker side of rock and roll, we'll say, and getting too heavily into drugs. So it was written as a warning to him, but when we recorded the song, I really didn't realize it was an anti-drug statement. I thought it was just about, you know, as you get older, it's hard to have fun. I thought it was just an innocent song about, you know, getting your kicks, uh, but uh, found out later that it was, you know, a big anti-drug anthem. How about uh, Stepping Out? Stepping Out was just a fun song. Uh, Revere had had well, this is this 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 is a really long story. It's 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 probably going to be too long and convoluted, and not really mean anything. All right, well, uh, maybe I got an Indian Reservation and Hungry Down. We we can do Indian Reservation okay. again. Indian Reservation was actually recorded as a Mark Lindsay single. Uh, Jack Gold, the uh, guy upstairs at CBS, said, "I've got this wonderful song for you, Mark. Indian Reservation." And I knew it had been recorded about six months before and had kind of topped off the charts. I said, I don't think so. He said, listen, I know you can do it. You're, you have Native American in you, which I am part Native American. And at that time, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee was number one on the bestseller charts. He said, I just have a feeling. So we recorded it as a, a Mark Lindsay single. And I was producing for the Raiders at the same time. And I just cut Birds of a Feather for the Raiders. So we're sitting there with these two songs. In the can, and I was so close to any reservation, I wasn't objective about it whatsoever. So we need a new single. And I said to Paul, well, look, I just cut this for me. And I just cut Birds of a Feather for the Raiders, you know, uh, but I'm not sure. This, this, this song, Birds is going to chart, I know. It's top 20, top 10. It's probably not number one. Any reservation, it could be number one. It could be nothing. You know, it's, it's a toss-up. He said, well, let's go with any reservation. And it was the largest single-selling record in the history of CBS Records to that date. Sold over 4 million copies. So I guess it was the right decision. That's great. How did you make the transition from having Terry as your producer and then kind of taking over? Was that a conscious decision by you? Well, uh, I took over the reins of producing from Terry mainly because of logistics. Terry was in, uh, in uh, Mallorca, Spain with Candy Bergen. They were having this giant affair at the time. Well, one, not an affair. They were friends on a trip together, folks. They were in Spain, and Terry was having such a great time. He didn't come back, and we needed a new single. And CBS said, we've got to have a single out. So I said, well, let me take a shot. And the first song I produced, Too Much Talk, went to number 11. And so they said, okay, you got the job. <laughs> and it wasn't really one I was looking for at the time. Well, that's interesting. I didn't know if it was like a personal choice by saying, 
let me have more control over what I'm doing or it's no it was, it was just it was a you know and I often wonder this is probably off the camera but I often wonder what where the Raiders sound would have gone if Terry had you know, stayed there you know the the next record I mean I did a couple of records consciously trying to emulate Terry and but it's hard to be somebody else you know yeah. but I often wonder that would be tough. Uh, what achievements are you most proud of as far as, uh, as being in the music business let's say Mm. That is a toughie. I, I don't. I don't. I, I. I can't answer that. I really can't. I mean, like, personally, it was a, an incredible rush to be on the Ed Sullivan show. I mean, this is a show you know every kid grows up watching, and someday I'll be on Ed Sullivan. I mean, that was incredible. But I don't think it was something that I'll go down to history for. I don't know. Maybe I, maybe my best songs are yet to come. And I, I understand you're getting back into performing. That's what we're here, here tonight for. Uh, tell me about uh, why you're getting back into performing or how you're doing it. Well, I, I stopped performing um, because it wasn't fun anymore. You know, it, for some reason, when any, any performer that starts uh, singing or playing an instrument uh, is doing it for l the love of playing. And, and if they're doing it for another reason, then, they, then usually, well, I'm gonna, let me start that one again. I think almost every player that loves music and singer starts doing it for the love of doing it, just for the, for the instant feedback from the audience and just the, the charge it gives you to be on stage doing your thing. And when you find that you can make money doing it, that's a, that's a plus. Uh, and I just played for so long that, that it, it, was, you know, it lost its, its luster. It wasn't fun anymore. So one day I just said, okay, that's it. If it's not fun, it's not worth doing. And uh, I stayed in the music business. I did I went into producing, built a recording studio, uh, worked as head of A&R for a UA Records for a couple of years. And finally, a friend of mine who'd been trying to get me out to do things for years said, uh, knew, he knew I wouldn't go out and perform. He said, would you host a show? I said, host a show? Sure, because I'd never done that. You know, I'd done everything else. So we get to Detroit, and it's the Temps and the Four Tops and the Association and the Birds and Spirit and Tommy James and a huge cross-section of American rock and roll. And uh, he said, we need 15 minutes. He said, can you do three songs? I went, oh, jeez. So we rehearsed it up, and it was great to be introduced as Mark Lindsay, our host for the evening, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Lindsay, and get a nice round of applause. But then to do the three numbers and get a standing ovation, it was like, wait a minute, this feels good again. And it started that spark, the th same thing that got me interested the first time, just the fun of doing it. So it's fun again, and that's what got me back into it. Well, where can people see you? Uh, we play about 75 to 100 dates a year. We play uh, festivals and fairs and uh, clubs here and there. And I don't know, just look, look in your paper, folks. We'll, hopefully we'll come to your town. Are you recording any new material? Just started my first, uh, uh, actually, just let me repeat, let me start that again. I just finished uh, my second... Uh, album, I guess we call them CDs these days, you know, the smaller albums, and I've got another one in the can, and I'm working on a third, so as, uh, as we speak, uh, the plan, there are plans to release this stuff, I think, probably next spring. Will that be a Mark Lindsay solo? It'll be Mark Lindsay? It'll be Mark Lindsay and the whatevers, or Mark Lindsay and the Mark Lindsay band, or Mark Lindsay and featuring Mark Lindsay. Okay. Uh, what kind of bands today that are popular do you kind of have a real respect for, or kind of maybe send you back and go, now, they're, they're onto something there that we were onto, or oh, anything boy. popular today that kind of stands out in your mind, or a singer, or anything like that? The, you know, that's, that's really tough, because I like songs, I mean, and there, there are various songs from groups that I think are stellar, just standout uh, tunes, and I, I've always been more of a, of a jukebox kind of a guy than, than one that was, of course, I mean, like, the Beatles can do no wrong. I mean, even today, I think their last, their last thing, the, where they mysteriously brought John in. Uh, at first, I thought, I don't know, but I listened to it and it grows on me. It's, it, they were magic, so they'll always be there. Um, there's a lot of great talent out there and a lot of uh, uh, good songs. And I think the emphasis is is turning around from overproduction back to the song and. It all starts with a song, and if you have a great song, then you can sing it, you know, then you can play it. So I, th I think more interesting, more introspective songs are being written now than were, say, maybe the last decade or two. So it looks like it's turning around that way, and that's real positive. I also feel, uh, Martin and I were talking about back in the 60s, early 70s, which is where I started just listening to music, it always seemed like this, the vocal, the lead vocalist was so powerful, and there's 
Rob Grill and you and uh, Dante, was that Rob Dante or whoever the Archie's lead singer was? Oh, yeah, uh, Ron. You know, the real strong lead vocalists that were there that you don't see today. You know, anybody can sing this grunge bands and stuff like that. Well, the uh, you, you look at, uh, at uh, Bono, you know, and... Uh, yeah, and what's what's that group? You uh, too. You too. Okay. Uh, yeah, he's he's a got an incredible voice. So he's kind of in that genre, uh, I think, of of great lead vocalists. But uh, it's true. I, there are a lot of you know. It's it's almost like the real early '60s where there were a lot of garage bands, and that's kind of turned around to that almost again. But but there's you know it. When, in the '60s, there were three classes of music, or maybe four. There was R and B. There was pop middle of the road, there was rock and roll, and, uh, and that's it. Maybe there were only three. But now there's, uh, it's, it's become so splintered, and so it's, it's called narrow casting now instead of broadcasting. There must say 40 categories of music. If you like to hear left-handed banjo players playing classical music, you can find it. You know, there's a niche for that. So even though there's a lot of different niches, it's, I think it makes it more interesting. There isn't a lot of mainstream one direction stuff, but there, if, you know, there's so much variety that you can find anything you want to listen to, I think. Great. Are we okay on time still? Yeah, we're fine. A couple more questions. We're fine. We're trying to even. All right. Um, just, uh, just, what about... Um, um, uh, uh, about Sinatra? Yeah. Uh, I think the will be trade. That that's 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 a toughie, Martin. That's I mean I, I like I say I like there are, there are a lot of great vocal performances on on certain I mean like even though uh, you wouldn't call Art Garf Garfunkel a belter, but his performance on Bridge Over Troubled Water is classic, you know things like that. Uh, yeah, he has an awesome voice. And uh, yeah, well, you know, Peter Gabriel is great. But try to think of it's it's there aren't really a lot of belters today, you know. But, you know, when you I think that I'm more impressed or most impressed, I think, with with um, how do I say this song interpretations. And it may be the way they turn a phrase or the hurt in their voice or whatever, more than just the overall power. It's the kind of the, the finesse that's so good that you don't really know they're doing it. You just suddenly get sucked into the emotion of the song. I think those performances impress me. What? Uh was there any singer or any when you were young that, that was like your idol and you said wow and you started emulating after them? Well, yeah, there would there would be a couple. I mean, Elvis, I thought of course was the king, and of course still is in a lot of people's mind. And Little Richard, I liked. I liked. Uh, um, I'm gonna have to do this again. Little Richard, yeah, sure, okay, one more time. Uh, I liked Elvis. Uh, matter of fact, I got in this business I think because I won a talent show singing Don't Be Cruel, and I got first place. Thanks, Elvis. And uh, Little Richard, uh, Buddy, Buddy Holly, um, Fats Domino. Um, I, liked, I liked rock and roll. I mean, like Bill Haley's stuff was good, just, just for the simple, I think it was the band and the singer and everything. But I was impressed by uh, just, just the excitement of rock and roll, I think. Great. Uh, let me get back into the, after you went into a and United Artists, mm -hmm. and so there was a story in one of your things about uh, Jerry Rafferty or something. Oh yeah, Were you instrumental in discovering him or well, something. Well, and I didn't. My first, before I got the job at UA, they gave me this album. They said, "Okay, this album is coming out in a couple of weeks. Are there any hits on this album?" So I said, "Let me listen to it." So I went home and played it. Came back, said, "Yeah." Said Baker Street's gonna be a number one record. It's a huge record. I said, "Then the follow up." I said, "Well, how many will it sell?" I said, "A million plus." And I said, the next single is uh, right down the line, and, and it'll, it's not as good as uh, Baker Street, but maybe it'll sell between five to 800,000. I said, the only other single on the album is uh, uh, Home and Dry, maybe three to four. I said, okay, you're on. I went, oh, boy. So we put out Baker Street, nobody played it. It was, you know, like six or seven minutes long. So I sat in uh, Charlie Miner's office, and while he called radio stations, and he called in one day like 17, 20 stations, to try to get them to play it. And I would listen to him, no, I can't, I don't like the, the guitar is too raucous for our format, or that saxophone thing, that's great, but it should be in the ending too. And then oh, everybody had excuses why they wouldn't play it. So I went home to my studio, made 17 different edits based on what the station said they didn't like or would rather hear. Threw him on, on Charlie's desk and on Monday morning said, 
send these out and ask them why they won't play it. And they went on it immediately because it was like, you know, a big coup. They made a custom edit for us. And uh, within, you know, two weeks, it was jumping up the charts. And finally, there was a standardized version that everyone played. But I made, uh, Jerry, wherever you are, I made 17 ed edits of your, you know, your fine record. But it was a great, great piece of music. It was a wonderful production. Was the edited version the one that I, we hear on the album today? Or did they it, just revert it, back to the original? It was, uh, the single, the single was edited. The album, I think it might have been cut down a little bit, but it was pretty close to the original length. But, uh, uh... And nowadays, of course, stations do custom edits for themselves. But it was a lot of fun. And, and, uh, and another interesting note, folks, I heard the saxophone player never got paid a penny for that session. <laughs> oh, poor guy. Yeah. That's, that's a nice part. Uh, what, what is in the future for you? Gosh, that's, that's hard to... Uh, well, I'm working on a book. Uh, I'm working on new music and as I have a luxury to experiment now, so I'm... I'm working on some instrumental, uh, we'll call it experimental music. Whether, whether it will ever hear the light of day or not, I don't know. I'm writing a lot, a lot of uh, stuff in the country vein. And, uh, and I just put out these records that are kind of more or less in the, in the pop, rock and roll genre. Uh, I don't know. My personal taste in music, if you, if you could go home and look at my CD collection or see where I've got the stations on the dial, I, I'm very eclectic. I like everything from country to classical, seriously and uh, listen to it all so and i like it all and that's always been one of my main problems is people say well what are you going to do when you grow up i don't know i don't know what do you do when you're not doing music uh i write i write work on the book or write uh, poetry or prose or or think <laughs> or relax great uh, now this one you don't have to answer if you don't want to uh, are there any wild stories from the 60s that you can tell us there are so many wild stories, but you're going to have to wait for the book. <laughs> <laughs>